Hello and welcome to C++ Weekly. I'm your host Jason Turner, available for code reviews, contracting, and on-site training. Now this episode is another one of those that is done in cooperation with Bloomberg and as always, the views and opinions and ideas presented are entirely my own. Now we need to discuss more about PMR because it's a big topic and custom allocation strategies are a big topic. Before we get going with this episode, I need to take a moment to try to clarify some terminology that I've used. Throughout this series, I have conflated the definitions of allocator and memory resource. This particular example here, the print alloc that I have, is not an allocator. And it's not really an allocator at all by any definition here. It is a memory resource, in fact that is inheriting from standard PMR memory resource and points to an upstream memory resource. This really should have been called print resource. And you'll note if you go back in these videos on PMR and this one and looking forward that I definitely conflate these two things. So something like printing resource here would be an appropriate name for this, which I'm sure then leads to the question of what exactly is an allocator. And for the sake of the C++ standard, the allocator is the concrete type that is actually passed to your vector, for example. So this thing, the second parameter to our template, this is the allocator, whatever that might be. Now for all of our examples, we are using the polymorphic allocator. And we are using this implicitly through the use of the standard PMR. Now note here this says a type mismatch because we didn't give an actual templated type here. So in this case, we are using explicitly the allocator is the standard PMR polymorphic allocator for int, and the memory resource that we are using is implicitly the default memory resource, whatever that may be at this point in the program's execution. So hopefully that clears up some of the terminology that I've conflated. Don't be surprised if I continue to conflate it throughout this episode. What I want to talk about is how and why custom allocation strategies can save you time and why they are more efficient. So we've got a handful of reasons. The simplest reason, first reason, is that we simply have fewer calls to new and delete. New and delete are getting memory from a global resource. This can cause contention, thread contention, for example. This is another reason, reduced thread contention for that global memory resource for new and delete. The next one gets a little interesting. Reduced false sharing. Uh, I'm going to group that together with reduced memory diffusion. Now, memory diffusion is a term specifically from uh, John Lakos, and it's one that he uses in several of his talks on allocators. If you go uh, and look any of those up, and I will have links to them in this description for this episode. Let's try to make some sense of this. Now, these three here are related. So if I've got the chunk of memory This is system RAM that I'm playing with right here. And I've got two threads, and I've got T1 and T2. And these two threads are each allocating memory. 
let's say during process startup, but whatever, maybe they're just allocating memory as the normal part of going about business. Thread one gets this chunk of memory. And then thread two gets potentially this chunk of memory. And thread one does another allocation, perhaps, and gets this chunk of memory. And thread two gets this chunk of memory. So this is not memory fragmentation, as John Lakos describes this, where with fragmentation, you might end up with gaps and holes in our memory here that we can't reuse because they're too small or something. This is diffusion, where we're getting the things in our data set just kind of, you know, scattered around wherever and, and random memory locations. And that's, you know, that's, that's not very good. So now what happens is if T1 wants to walk through all of the memory that belongs to it, it's going to go and ask for some memory from the CPU and effectively it's going to go to the cache and it's going to say, hey, I need this chunk of memory. I need the chunk of memory that's, you know, say right here. And what it's going to get back into the cache is, you know, hypothetically this entire chunk. Now, when thread one wants to walk over its memory, it has to go here and then it has to skip this location and then it has to access this location and skip this location and etc. And it becomes all quite a bit messy. And then we have this other problem that if thread one and thread two are both trying to access this memory at the same time, they're both going to be pooling the same chunks of memory into their cache at once. So on, you know, let's say that these are actually running on separate cores because that's kind of important for this illustration. So if I go and I am thread one and I update a value here, I just, I put the value one right here. But thread two also already had this memory in its cache. This is going to cause the cache to have to synchronize with main memory. And that is the false sharing and the thread contention, them having to access the same global memory resource to do this, and the memory diffusion issue. So if instead each thread has its own local allocator, now this can be a pool monotonic or a pool with a monotonic, I don't really care. And I've got thread one and I've got thread two, which are each doing their own allocations. Doesn't matter what kind of allocations they're doing. And thread one asks for a chunk of memory, it's going to get this one. And thread two asks for a chunk of memory, it's going to get this one. And then thread one asks for another chunk of memory, it's going to get this one. And so on and so forth. And we end up basically completely eliminating thread contention, false sharing, memory diffusion issues, because each thread using its own using its own local allocator is going to have direct access to the memory that it needs. Now, if it exhausts this memory and it has to go out to the new delete resource from time to time, that's not a problem. It's going to get another chunk of memory, an arena of memory, if you will. And these are all spectacularly good things. So let's go ahead and demo this real quick. So I have this create and access benchmark that I've created and I've put up on my GitHub repository so you can play with it if you want to. It creates 100,000 objects and then it goes through a thousand times and modifies this to try to force this issue of what false sharing and um, memory diffusion or whatever could look like. And then we are using our allocator strategy that was passed into us and I've got several in here you can go and look at this but I've got a new delete one a monotonic and a pool monotonic now this number right here is how many bytes of memory the monotonic backing should start with and I just have 10 in here because I didn't see a huge difference between these 
and then I run it with one, three, five, seven, and 10 threads. Now this particular virtual machine that I'm running on has 10 threads available to it. So I've run that here and we can actually see that for one thread, these three perform pretty similarly. So that's actually good news to us because it means that the next effects that we see after this are going to be more related to what happens with thread contention, false sharing, those kind of issues than not. So what we see is by the time we get to 10 threads being run, uh, which is the physical limitation of this particular computer, we start to see quite a bit more thread contention. So if we look at the median, that's uh, 76 million nanoseconds for whatever that's worth. And if we have the monotonic resource, we're at 55 million and the monotonic with a pool with a monotonic backing, we're at 51 million. So we can see a pretty significant difference here. And this is a very simple and contrived example. In real world examples, you might see even more than this, but we're showing uh, that it's about 25% faster because of this reduced contention between the threads. But there's something else that I think is perhaps a little bit more important to point out, and that is the standard deviation here. This is how much the test fluctuate. And with a new and delete resource, we see huge fluctuations between each run of these uh, performance tests. And if we compare it to the monotonic and the local allocators, then we see considerably less volatility in how long it takes for these to run. So that's just a little taste at how you can get better performance by having local allocators per thread. But coming back to this, we mentioned reduced memory diffusion, reduced false sharing, reduced thread contention, and fewer calls to new and delete. We'll do a quick example of that in a moment. But I want to make one other quick point about this create and access test. So let's go ahead and do this create and access. And we want to do Well, part of the problem is that I am on a relatively new Ryzen here, which has an absolutely gigantic cache. Let's go ahead and run these through cache grind to see if it shows us any difference. So I've got my new and delete that I am running first. So Volgrind is running a simulation of our program. It's running the program in an emulator effectively. So that makes it very s slow but it also gives it the ability to do things like estimate cache hits and misses. So our D1 cache, this is our data cache, 23.2% cache miss rate. And this is with the new and delete running with 10 threads. And now I'm running the simple monotonic test. So this is an 18.5% cache miss rate versus a 23% cache miss rate. So we can see where the performance differences are actually coming into play for some of these uh, operations here. And play with the numbers a lot because, it's, again, it depends completely on your hardware and your actual use cases. I want to go back to the example that we left off on in the last episode to talk about how we can get just a little bit better performance by reducing calls to new and delete. And we have this very fancy thing set up here, but in this particular code, we're not calling new and delete at all. We get this bad allocate out of memory error if we do, and that's why we needed to have a large buffer here. So if we take this pretty trivial example where I've got my data buffer that I plan to be using repeatedly, and I've got my monotonic buffer resource with some underlying data here, and I'm creating this vector, and that's all I'm doing in this, versus this one, which is calling new and delete, we can see a fairly sizable difference. This kind of thing is absolutely touchy. We've seen this before. We need to make sure that we are being smart about how we're using this data and what the compiler is able to optimize and make sure that we don't 
use a monotonic buffer resource for something that grows continuously. But this kind of thing can be pretty fast, and this helps a lot in the case where you've got some very small local blob of cache data or processing data of some sort that you just need to work with for a few minutes before you pass it on to another function. If you can fit that into something that is on the stack in the monotonic buffer resource, then you can have a fairly considerable savings. Now, the next thing that we need to see is uh, it's something kind of like a garbage collection. And it's called winking out of memory. Now, this is absolutely an advanced topic. This is not something that you're going to do all the time. And this is something that I'm going to dig into a little bit more in the next episode, which will have the pros and cons of this particular possibility. But I've got this memory resource here, this monotonic buffer resource. Now I'm going to create a polymorphic allocator from it. And now I'm going to use this allocator to create my vector. The interface that I'm going to be using is an interface that is specifically from C20, uh, but there are definitely ways to do it. And before C20 and C17, as you can see here in CPP reference, we have the equivalent code. So what I've done here is I've actually created the vector inside the allocator itself. This is something we've only touched on in previous episodes. And for each loop iteration, I'm not bothering to delete the vector because I don't need to. Because all of the data contained in that vector actually exists in the allocated resource itself. So if it all gets to destroyed at once, we're not actually calling the destructor, but if it all goes away at once, then it's actually a perfectly safe thing to do. But it is very, very easy to get wrong. And that is, again, something that we'll talk about uh, in the next episode. So we've got fewer calls to delete, reduced thread contention, reduced false sharing, reduced memory diffusion, uh, aka Increased memory contig contiguity. It seems to be a word. And then finally, something like a garbage collection ability to just make all of the memory go away. This becomes more interesting in deeply nested tree structures when uh, destructing all of the deeply nested things actually becomes a very expensive operation because the destructors have to happen in a recursive call. And sometimes that can't be done efficiently. And in fact, there was a keynote a few years ago at CPPCon from Herb Sutter about this particular issue. And if you were to use a custom allocator and ensured that all of the things inside your tree structure existed in the allocator, you don't have to worry about destroying things necessarily, depending on what the goals are for your data. You can just make it go away. Again, very advanced topic. This is not something to be uh, taken lightly here. I hope you enjoyed this one, and uh, be sure to tune in for my next episode. Subscribe if you haven't already.